So here we invoke the CDMA, uplink CDMA analogy for large MIMO systems, uh, where uh, where the same where the receive signal. Say from now on, I just assume the only the user one and cell one. It's actually uh, symmetric for all the users in the system. Uh, so the received signal. Uh, so so uh, the compared the, as compared to the like CDMA, we can see that the channel vector, the m cross n channel vector, is equivalent to the uh, signature sequence in the sense it uniquely identifies a user if there are a large number of antennas, and uh, the number of base station. Uh, and that's actually contributed to the processing game. Uh, but the major, uh, but the major requirement for a MIMO system is to do the channel estimation, not to unlock the positive effects of a MIMO system. So, in order to do channel estimation, some amount of uh, time, some amount of the coherence time has to be allocated for training. Uh, we see that if there are k users per cell and b <coughs> cells, then uh, we require kb orthogonal pilots uh, for training. However, uh, the main the main motive to present this is uh, we may not be actually possible to train uh, orthogonally for all the users in the system because we might run out of the uh, coherence time or we run out of time to actually transfer the data. So I, I show this with an example. Consider a system. Consider so in this work, I consider by by a resource block. What I mean is uh, the set of coherent subcarriers and coherent time. Uh, the uh, the set of resources in ortho coherent subcarrier and coherent time. So consider a PLB with uh, 14 coherent subcarriers and seven coherent uh, symbols. And if you are having p allocating p symbols per user, and there are kb users in the system, uh, then uh, we we will have uh, kbb symbols for uh, transmission for channel training. Now we see that if uh, uh, now and 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 this minus this value is the uh, number of resource elements available for. Uh, transmission of the data. So for, with, the, with this example, we see that 14 to 7 is 98. We have 98 resource elements in a resource block. And if we have 14 users per cell and a 7 cell system, we already run out of uh, uh, run out of time for data transmission. So the, the point of the slide is it's not possible to train for orthogonally for all the users in a resource block. We consider an alternate scenario where a base station is just concerned about uh, training only its own uh, only its own users, users that are under that base station. So users in the same cells and orthogonal pilot symbols. Uh, <coughs> however, so the users in other cell uh, are has sent synchronized pilot symbol, but that user sends synchronized pilot symbol with users in the other cell. So basically, what happens is that a user I in each cell. Uh, since the same pilot symbol in the each PRB. So if there are B cells, then there are like B minus one overlap user, user B minus one overlapping pilot symbols of a user from other cell. Uh, this ends up in, uh, in in a particular issue called pilot contamination, where the channel estimate of the of this particular first user in the first cell is actually the actual channel. Plus the sum of the channels from uh, plus the sum of plus the sum of the channel from other cells. So the so this this particular the channel of a user from other cell is is, is called is what is termed as pilot contamination. So uh, assuming that this particular uh, channel estimate the true channel, if we have if we employ a match filtering system. Uh, we have a result. Uh, uh, we have a result that as as the number of antennas tends to in, uh, tends to infinity, the SINR is actually limited by something called pilot contamination, where this is the uh, this is the this is the this is the so this is the power contributed by the overlapping pilots. Uh, 
So this this so this is this this is an ideal scenario with an uh, infinite number of antennas. Now what we can think of is a, is a situation where uh, m and k are comparable. We can all, uh, say for in the, in the earlier example, if you can consider 14 users per cell and a 50 antenna system, then already uh, the you can consider that m and k are comparable. Where in this case, k by m is like almost equal to 1 by 3. So. So in order to get the, in order to motivate the problem, we we plot the SINR CDF under these conditions. We consider a seven-cell system with each radius two kilometers. We consider six interfering cells to a center cell. We consider a more dense system like 50 users per cell uniformly spread per base station and 50 antennas per base station system. So supposedly, uh, when you actually schedule data transmissions from the users, you'll be picking a subset of those 50. Right? But for problem of pilot. Design you're saying you consider all 50? Uh, no, uh, what I'm uh, during the data transmission, I assume that all the users are simultaneously transmitted, like 50 users are yes, okay. simultaneously yeah. transmitted. And then, and, and there's, yeah. there's no user selection within that. No, no, there's no use. I assume that some scheduler has already selected that this much number of users should be. So 50 is already a subset? So. Yeah, it's already a subset. So uh, this is the CD of the SINR. Uh, the the blue curve corresponds to the uh, ideal scenario when M goes to infinity with the perfect channel estimate. We end up end up getting a SNR. Uh, the red curve corresponds to the SNR with pilot contamination, uh, where uh, they send out the pilot contamination as shown earlier. Uh, and 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 these two correspond to the case. Uh, when with the 50 uh, antennas per base station and 50 users per cell. So the black curve is the uh, case with the perfect estimate and the green is with the pilot contaminated channel estimate. And we are doing match filtering. So what we what we are trying to explain is uh, the shift of 25 dB, which is actually we know is contributed by pilot contamination plus uh, plus interference. The question is, can we quantify that? How do we quantify that? Again, could you explain what the four colors are here, please? Yeah, so this... Uh, this I assume that I have a perfect channel estimate and I do a match filtering. I, I get a CDF. But that's SNR. No. Yeah. No, that's SNR because as M goes to infinity, I can perfectly cancel oh, all the. That, but that's ignoring it, the pilot contamination. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Got it. It's kind of a benchmark for my. Yeah. And this corresponds to the uh, channel estimate, and I'm doing a, a match filtering, assuming the with the pilot contaminated channel estimate. So imperfect knowledge and pilot contamination shifts you from blue down to red. Red, yes. Okay. And this is the case when I assume comparable M and K. In this particular example, it's 50 users per base station, 50 antennas. So red is the number of antennas going to infinity. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. So now, what are black and green or blue? Uh, the black corresponds to the case when I have a perfect channel estimate, but I have 50 users per cell and 50 antennas per base station. Which means, like, basically, a situation where m is comparable to k, and in this case, one. Again, and what is the horizontal axis and the vertical axis here? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the horizontal axis is the SNR, and the uh, vertical axis is the uh, the CDF, the the probability uh, probability density function. CDF. CDF. I mean, cumulative density. Distribution. Yeah. Distribution. So between blue and red, there's still one other activity going on. Blue has a finite number of antennas, or it would be infinitely good, right? And red has uh, an infinite number of antennas that's limited by the pilot contamination yes. and the imperfect channel, is that? Yes. No, blue has actually, blue ha has infinite number of antennas. But you're assuming blue that there was no pilot contamination, so why isn't it getting performance getting arbitrarily good as you add more and more antennas. Yes, so uh, in, so in order, to in order to avoid that, I actually assume that during the data transmission, I transmitted a power scaled by the number of antennas. Ah, uh, okay, got it. So, All right, so... So that's why I'm getting the sigma square. Uh, instead, if I assume uh, that the transmit okay. power is not scaled by the number of antennas, I'll All be right. dividing by m, and Understood. the sigma square will be... The sigma, we won't have this noise effect at all. <coughs> so this is so that we can actually compare. So constant radiated power as you increase, total radiated power as you increase number of antennas. Yes. Okay. 
so uh, so are these uh, plots clear? So the point is, what we like to do is we like to quantify this 25 dB shift due to comparable M and K. So uh, in order to accomplish that, we have to uh, we plan to do it by uh, a large system analysis. We will we, uh, we let the number of antenna goes to infinity and the number of users go to infinity, maintaining a fixed K by M ratio of alpha. So alpha, wherever the whole uh, uh, thesis is K by M, uh, and uh, we plot we analyze the performance of SINR linear receivers, both matched and MMC receivers assuming a pilot corrupted channel estimate for different values of alpha. So before, uh, this is just a general expression for the SINR, for the user 1 and cell 1. Uh, if C is a received linear filter, uh, then the P signal can be written uh, in this particular form. Uh, the P noise is uh, straightforward. Uh, uh, using the intuition from already established results on pilot contamination, I can write that uh, the user one and the other cells contribute to the uh, pilot contamination. I can write the pilot contamination power in this particular form. Here, uh, one corresponds to the user one and the other cells, and the rest of it contribute to the interference. So I get the SINR is basically the signal signal power by noise plus pilot power interference. Uh, we can uh, we can invoke the uh, now, before and before the actual result, we can invoke the CDMA large system analysis with the perfect estimate. Uh, so we know that as m goes to infinity, each user's channel, uh, each pair of user's channel tend to be orthogonal. But however, uh, the interference power contributed by the sum of the interference contributed by all the users uh, is non-zero and tends to this particular value alpha. And the expectation of beta where alpha is a ratio of k by m, and beta corresponds to the random variable representing the realization, realization of this particular uh, number. This this is a sum. Uh, those beta JKs are the. Yeah. Yeah. So I those beta. I finished my sentence. Okay. Those beta JKs are the. Those beta JKs uh, are the. Uh, so this corresponding to the kth user, uh, corresponding to the kth user in all uh, in the, all the cells, we just sum. <coughs> Some the beta j's. Correspond they're, they're the large scale fading factors, right? Yeah, we, we sum the large scale uh, received powers of the kth user of all the cells. And if you take an arbitrary user, uh, there's uh, the received power is a random variable, and that random variable is represented by beta. What's the significance of the expectation of beta that you have in that uh, middle equation? Beta varies randomly because the position of the terminals is varying randomly. And, uh, yes. Our, I forget whether you're including log normal shadow fading as well as part of beta. Yes, yes. Uh, the, so I, went, I consider that the beta that I receive are, uh, are uh, part of, uh, has in itself the attenuation due to distance as well as log normal shadow. Right, but I'm wondering. You're, so you're literally taking a expectation over the randomness of beta in that a formula. Yes, yes. No, this is uh, yes. It so ends up that if you have infinite number of users, the the effect of interference uh, tend to average out like this. Okay, so, so you're just it is a limiting result. In the limit is yeah. Okay, I'm just. It's not a Taking the sum of large yes. Uh, am I, am I yeah, I mean you're not doing. I mean you. It's, I mean if you're trying to get you know capacity expressions or that sort of thing, then implicitly you're you're invoking some sort of uh, noisy channel coding theorem, and which implies you're doing uh, channel coding <coughs> for many independent realizations of all of the sources of randomness that are at work and. Uh, you clearly can't do that. Well, maybe, I don't know, that's a good question. Uh, can you really uh, do ergodic coding over this, what amounts to slow fading, or uh, do you need to uh, not do that? Uh, okay. It's a rambling question. I don't know if you can make sense of it. Uh, I think I need to probably uh, look We'll discuss it, it offline, perhaps. Look into it more, more detail. Right. Okay. So, uh, so this is the uh, this is the case with a, with a perfect estimate. Uh, 
the 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 main uh, scenario is if alpha if there are a finite number of users and infinite number of antennas, we we end up getting this SNR. So even if you don't assume that summing a large number of uh, data, so you could have just left that as alpha times summation of those beta JKs, and it would have just been the conditional probability, conditional SNR for that drop, for that yeah. realization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, would have been yes. Given that I know the betas, that is the SNR that I will be getting. So our contribution to this is, is like, uh, what happened if you do a match filtering? With a pilot contaminated channel estimate, and uh, what happens to the uh, asymptotic SINR? So, we have a result which says that if M and K in, uh, increases to infinity as a fixed ratio alpha, then uh, the SINR converges almost sure, surely to this particular expression, uh, where, the, the, where the red terms here corresponds to the uh, pilot contamination power, and uh, the alpha B corresponds to the uh, uh, it corresponds to the interference averaging of the yeah corresponds to the interference averaging due to simultaneous transmission during the data time during the data transmission time here again the beta is a representation of a random same uh, random variable summation of the random variables uh, the proof is uh, given to this uh, if you see this result if uh, as uh, alpha goes to zero we will recover what uh, we have earlier uh, result on pilot contamination it says that as m goes to infinity, uh, the SNR is limited by uh, pilot contamination. So this is the this is the extension of the case when we have comparable number of users and uh, users and antennas per cell. We uh, did a simulation setup with an ideal ideal scenario where uh, we assume that equal powers are received at the base station from the users in the first cell. And the other cell receive powers can be uh, equal as well as uh, because of two cases where the other cell receive powers can be equal as well as a 10 dB lower. So this is kind of an ideal scenario where every user is transmitting, every other cell user is transmitting at about 10 dB lower than that of the in cell user, uh, as well as transmitting the same power as that of in cell users. That uh, what you're saying is that for someone in the other cell transmitting that center cell, say in the 10 dB lower case. Their large scale beta factor. Yeah, yeah. So these are actually uh, the one same tenth of what it is for someone in the center cell. Yes, <coughs> yes. Yeah. So, kind of this, you know, this question of the randomness you talked about over the positions, you've kind of uh, um, simplified it in terms of generating numerical results by this. Yes. Yeah. Instead of randomness, I assume that it's like kind of fixed power I'm seeing from the users from the other side. So the, you don't have shed on them, or? Uh, no, actually not. I just assume that uh, like uh, the, the the receive the <coughs> the users from other cells are constant. Uh, okay. Individual users from other cells are just received at power point one, where the in cell users are received at power one. But you have the distance account. Uh, this actually, in this particular thing, since it's an ideal, it's, uh, since I'm already quantifying, uh, saying beta is this, so uh, I think distance is not uh, okay, a factor. So, okay. so there's no distance-based <coughs> pass loss or shadowing in this. So uh, there are three plots here. What I'm plotting is in the x-axis the alpha, which is the which is k by m. Uh, I'm, ba I'm basically having a fixed uh, M of 50 antennas per base station, and I'm increasing K from say one user to nearly 75 users per cell. And in the y-axis, I'm plotting the SINR. Here also, I'm plotting the SINR. Here, I'm plotting the rate. So, and the blue the blue curve correspond corresponds to the asymptotic SINR expression with a perfect channel estimate, and the black corresponds to the asymptotic SINR expression. Uh, with a pilot contaminated channel estimate with a match filter. So we see that there is a constant, uh, so this corresponds to the case when all powers, even the other cell users are received at the equal powers as the in-cell users. So we see that there is a, 
uh, there's a shift uh, that the black curve performs worse than uh, the blue curve because of the primarily because of the pilot contamination, and and, and these points corresponds to the uh, simulation simulation results assuming a particular realization of fading. So these uh, we can see that all these uh, I brought. I brought around 25 points. So we see that these points are clustered around the asymptotic limit, uh, validating our uh, uh, the expression for uh, validating our expression for different values of alpha. So, so in those red points, the user you actually uh, root out the users in the other cells. And no, the users are still being received as the same power, but I assume that. Uh, created instances of the of the small signatures yes. and and uh, calculated the SINR for each instance of of the antenna signatures of all the users across the whole system. Yes. Again, for that first plot in the upper left, the our uh, the graph, the uh, is it zero dB or minus ten dB? The interference from the other cells. Uh, this is zero dB. Zero dB. It's okay. pretty strong interference from us. Yeah, I was just trying. I mean, roughly, you're getting a, uh, you know, it looks like a 12 dB uh, degradation when you switch from perfect knowledge to pilot. And I was just wondering if you could qualitatively explain why it's 12 dB. Is there a simple explanation uh, or intuitive thing? It isn't obvious to me, but the the 12 dB is basically because I assume a seven cell system and there are six interferers. Okay. That's the, I think that. The, the okay. Good. All right. So, so this mm -hmm. is six times, six times your uh, intracell value. Yes. So if you assume noise is small, then you have x as your uh, received SNR, six x as your interference. Yes. Oh. Yes. So you're but the degradation, though, it's in, it's in a funny way, right? It's because he has these six sources of interference in estimating the pilot. So then he, he takes this 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 uh, channel estimate, right, and then uses that as a, essentially as a match filter. Yeah. So you can't do right? direct. You're doing so sort of direct SIR calculation. That, yeah. But that's this sort of the way it manifests itself is it shows up as an error in the channel estimate. So it's so built into a nice this but in the perfect, okay, I see, I see. So in the so perfect case also there is, perfect case also there is interference. There is interference. Yeah, there, there, there is, there is no so estimate. So the perfect case would have perfect. the degradation versus no other cells. You could do a calculation of, oh, it's six other cells, and, and you know, compared to the SNR, you would, you would have a degradation. I think that's how it works. I mean, you don't yes. have, so when we say match filter, right? Think of the CD analogy, it's like you didn't know your signature sequence exactly. And you're correlating with something else. No, you're just projecting the signal direction for the desired user, right? You're not making any attempt at nulling the interference. No, 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 no but, but no. the desired user's channel, we don't know. But in the perfect plot, you know it perfectly. I know, perfect plot, I know the channel. But in, the, in this cat, I, I don't know the channel, but I assume it is uh, uh, achieved through training, so but it is by the so the interference issue, it's just the numerator. Yeah, so the interference is there in both cases, right? But the real effect is that the pilot can, because of the it's pilot so contamination, awesome. exactly. So you're not correlating with exactly with the filter you should be using, because you don't have your channel. So it's, yeah, so that's a good question. I, I thought perhaps we had some discussion about this. Why it was 12 dB, and you're saying it's, it, it shows up in 7 cells, that's what you No, actually, if you. So uh, in this, yeah. so in this case, so so if you, so, so basically beta one one is one and all these are one actually. So what we get here is uh, beta b minus one, and so what you what you get here is b minus one and this is b, but you have a b here as well. So I think if you, uh, should I write? Yeah, yeah. Let's see or But essentially you're saying all this gap that changes with 
if you change the number of B, is the B minus one is the number of interfering cells. Yes, yes. And that this this is what shifts this curve. This yes, yeah, that's 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 the number of uh, pi interference is what the shifts. Okay, so you're you're saying you're able to explain the constant gap in some sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's the number of uh, the interfering cells during the pilot transmission is what is causing this shift. So the like, so you can see from this expression the re the rest of it is actually same as uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the interference contributed by simultaneous transmission is is always quantified by alpha in the expectation of beta, expectation of beta but uh, the shift is only uh, is quantified by the pilot contamination power. Uh, I think it, uh, yeah. Just to make sure, because I think we had a similar discussion during your proposal. Yes. Did you end up really throwing down the user and doing the estimation, or are you simply, for your channel estimate, you're using the expression for pilot contamination? No, I do have results with the actual channel estimate. But this, this is not that. This doesn't include it. But no. I have this, I have, uh, like, in the coming slides, I have a result for, and I just throw down the users and assuming a different random receipt powers. And and not just the different received power, but because of the delay, your your uh, even pilots won't be fully correlated because you, you are because of some delays. Your if you design your pilot well enough, your yeah, yeah. even though you are you, this formula is based upon your pilots exactly being the same. Yes, it won't be the case when you in reality throw down the users. Yes, I do have that. So where I assume that we have independent. Uh, but orthogonal uh, in cell training in all the cells. Okay, well, when, we, yeah. when you get to that. It's time to though, like the question you were asking is the channels going, is it uh, sort of fading over time? Was that the gist of no, it? No, the, the gist of my question was if it's related to the discussion we had, which is that uh, the, the expression that is derived for pilot contamination. Uh, assume sort of the worst case, right? All the cores are aligned, oh. and and because of that, but in reality, when you throw down the user, even if you were to give two users the same uh, signature for pilot, uh, because of the misalignment, if your code were designed in the right way, uh, you will have like you know if, it, if you have because of the time shift, they may not be that correlated. But if that time shift is within the uh, span of the cyclic prefix, won't well, that cyclic yeah, prefix so so OFDM right, compensate so for that? Right. So if it's if it's depends upon the uh, upon the time delay, and okay. the shift duration, and all those. Yeah, I think I have an answer to that question. Probably in the coming slides. Okay. So the second part of the response is the fact that uh, I receive uh, the other cell interference. Uh, I received the user's power from other cell at 10 dB lower than what I received for the in-cell users. Uh, we can see that uh, the since the interference, other cell interference is low, we can, uh, the pilot, even though we have a pilot estimate, we, it performs marginally better than the case when, than this case. And uh, even though, the, and this, this corresponds to 25 realization of SNR, assuming uh, different small scale, uh, assuming uh, where this takes into account the effect of uh, small scale fading. So, however, uh, when it comes to plotting the when, when it's come to plotting the rate versus the alpha uh, for this particular case, uh, we see that even though uh, the realizations are uh, over and below the asymptotic limit, we see that the rate, the the simulation results give exact rate for for uh, give the exact rate. This is total rate uh, summed over all of the k uh, terminals. Uh, no, this or is like this per, per, per user. Per user. Down there. <coughs> this is a per user rate. Okay, and the reason that it's decreasing with alpha is that with more users, there's less power to beam to each user, and so he suffers accordingly. Is that? The yes. Intuition? So uh, as you increase alpha. Uh, as you increase uh, uh, alpha, the effect of uh, interference uh, also plays into picture. Okay. But I think actually, um, you know, he has, if you were increasing 
you know, the, it's one of these discussions, are you borrowing K or M? Right. But he's working in uplink. And right. K. I just realized so, I was thinking yeah, partially yeah. about downlink yeah, yeah. when I said beaming. You're not but beaming at all. Of he's course. increasing the number yeah. of users and they're just yeah. subjective. More, more interference. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, in terms of finding the rates, this, uh, the asymptotic is actually uh, uh, a very good, a useful tool. So, so we get the exact rate. And you have those are simulations on top of that, is it? Uh, yes. So these uh, red points. Uh, so did I, So these red points correspond to the fact that I uh, take a log of one plus SNR of this point and take the average. And and uh, take the average across all these uh, realizations. That could happen, and that's why that's how I'm getting this uh, red point, which are basically simulation results. And you find that the simulation match the uh, asymptotic uh, rate predicted. So this is true even for a 50 antenna base station. I guess there's another thesis in there about whether whether the uh, the log of this one plus SINR is an achievable rate for real, right? Having to do with whether the situation is a or not a or Yeah. But, but at least, so we understand, I think, what, what, what the metric is. Should we have a candidate? So, no, I don't have a candidate. No, we were discussing more funding. <laughs> we were discussing with Tom, you know, right. You, you have to, you know, get funding. Fund, get funding and build up. <laughs> yeah, it's a problem. So he's lever he's looking to you know it's you know, they would like to have <laughs> uh. Okay. <coughs> so so far we have uh, done the uh, like plotted the results for a for a match filter receiver assuming pilot contaminant channel estimate. Uh, we can also uh, think of a an MMSC receiver uh, which minimizes the expected mean square error between the transmitted symbol and the received uh, signal, uh, subject to the fact that I assume, uh, conditional the fact that I assume that uh, the, the estimate is the, the, the true channel. So uh, such a filter is actually given by this expression, uh, uh, where in order, in order to evaluate this uh, covariance, the covariance matrix of the received signal subject to the uh, conditioned on the channel estimate, uh, I, b I basically split the received signal as the uh, the channel estimate plus the channel error plus the other cell interference plus the uh, noise. Uh, we see that the the filter can, can then be given by this particular expression where uh, the channel estimate actually reflects in the, in the kind of the like gives it the the direction and theta 1 and theta 2 corresponds to the uh, uh, constants which depend on the estimation error as well as the other cell interference. For in this case, the theta 1 into y uh, rep represents the other cell interference co covariance which is given by this particular expression and the estimation error covariance is given by uh, this particular ex expression. I'm missing why you need the estimation error covariance because you're uh, going to compute your filter types on the basis of the channel estimate. So where does the, is, is it in the analysis that it's coming in? Or? Yes, yes, I assume uh, the, uh, yes, I assume the filter is based on uh, the channel estimate that I have. And I assume that, and I assume that that is a true channel that, and so then, yeah, that, that comes out in the analysis. Okay. And uh, in order to have some benchmark uh, of performance, we consider the perfect filter when I have an uh, exact channel estimate. So in this case, the only difference is instead of h hat, I will have the actual channel, and I will, I will not have theta two, which corresponds to the covariance matrix of the uh, of the estimation error. Uh, so we have this particular results, which is uh, the asymptotic result for an MMC receiver, where I uh, where I where we see that as m goes to infinity. In as the number of antennas in the users per cell goes to infinity at a fixed ratio, we, can, we see that the SNR converges almost surely to this particular expression, where the only difference between this and the and the match filter is that I have an additional factor C, which helps me to suppress the interference. 
so again, the proof is in the thesis, uh, and it uses uh, they steal this transform for symmetric matrices. So there should be a way to evaluate C. Uh, C is given by this particular big expression, where in order to evaluate C, we need eta one and eta two. Eta one can be solved as a fixed point equation, and eta two once we know eta one, we can calculate eta two, and using that we can calculate C. The expectation is over the joint distribution of uh, beta ones and beta. Uh, so beta is as uh, defined earlier, and beta one corresponds to the uh, is a is a random variable which represents the realization of the of an arbitrary user in the first cell. And beta j is a random variable which uh, corresponds to the uh, realization of an arbitrary user in the j cell. So you, so even though we don't know the joint distribution, we can calculate this by using uh, or by f finding the average over different positions of the user user realizations. Can you give some intuitive explanation of this C factor? I I'm having a little hard time wrapping my head around this expression. Uh, the C uh, the C factor comes because uh, the C factor comes because in this in this filter we have this uh, this particular uh, channel estimate, and uh, this is actually a symmetric matrix. And so, so once if it is symmetric matrix, we can in invoke the uh, Stieltz transform result for random matrices. I, I guess my, my question was a little different. I mean, I understand why C comes in. It comes yeah. in because you are able to do. You, you are using a better filter than just a linear match filter. Uh, just than just a match filter, you are doing kind of messy estimation. Yes. And so, effectively, you are suppressing the, the interference a little better. So yes. And. and Intuitively, your SINR should go up because of uh, that. Yes. So that I understand. I was just trying to, like, an intuitive understanding of the C factor itself, like. Like, for instance, if you look at that expression, right? Yes. Do you have some intuition of what those terms are? Like, what happens that the next one, C no, goes no, up, no. goes okay. down, like, this you know, it's, I mean, I, okay, I'm yeah. sure mathematically it is the right, and you use the right tools. I'm just for my own understanding, trying to, like, what's the intuitive, okay, like, what happens at this, you know, or maybe it's coming later, this key grows like this with this factor or whatever, right? I mean, right now, if I look at it, I, I, I'm sure it's fine mathematically, but yeah. like, what does it tell me intuitively? I'm not sure. I think it's actually uh, probably clear as in the following slides. Uh, if not, I will uh, try to uh, answer that. Uh, I would think it will be clear. Okay. So maybe I, maybe I don't know whether this is the right time. Go back to the previous uh, slide. So when uh, k by m gets uh, small, okay, yes. then your performance here should start approaching the performance of a match filter. Because essentially, just projecting in the signal direction is equivalent to analog rate difference because you have orthogonality from the channel itself. Does that bear out from this? Uh, no, actually, I am not using the actual channel grid. I'm using the channel estimate, which is actually uh, corrupted pilot corrupted channel estimate. And they affect, uh, but then, uh, so they're they're affecting the matched filter and the MMSE in different ways. Right? Uh, the, uh, no, no, I would say that the pilot uh, con uh, using a if k by m becomes zero, then the, the term just drops out. Yes. So yes. The same performance for yes. Match filter. Yes. If uh, yes, if alpha is zero, then we have same performance as match filter. Even if we use an MMC uh, filter with a with a pilot estimate, pilot contaminant estimate. So how come C doesn't depend on alpha? Does does it depend on? Alpha? It doesn't. It doesn't depend on. It, it's just a. It's just but a. It scale. The effect is scaled by yeah. alpha, right? right? Yeah. The whole sum of C doesn't. Depend you know, it's funny, I've always looked at this and this, uh, you know, I kind of asked that question, I didn't make any progress and concluded C is a, an algebraic fact because of rearranging everything to put it in this form to, to show what the, the old thing was, right, to separate out something that is the, the improvement, right, and it somehow I felt like, oh, well, the question you're asking is lost in, in trying to 
basic as well. So, right, so, sorry. Okay, I actually I didn't get to. No, so but, uh, no, I'm actually not so surprised by that. If you, I'm sort of given that I still remember CDMA and multi-user detection. Yeah. Which okay, so Roy, I would always joke about going back about 20 years ago. If you really look at the MMSC receiver and it was pressing interference, uh, in the limit, at least asymptotic limit, sigma is zero, right? Sort of, which is what yeah. the favorite sort of regime people looked at. It is near far resistant in the sense that it becomes independent of how many users are there. Okay. Right? So MMSC sort of has this near, you know, it has this near far resistance. So therefore, intuitively, it tells me that it should not, uh, given that, you know, sort of having some similar analogy, right? it perhaps should not depend on the number of users. Okay. Can it be a May analogy to the rescue? It's like the beat of this. To the rescue. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, the rhyme that we, we, we started reading your paper with it, and we were like, what is going on here? What is it? So for some moment, we realized like, oh, Right, I, I can understand this if I just pretend this is a CDMA signature <laughs> and, a, and, a, and a now a mismatched correlator, you know, using the wrong signature and suddenly, and so, then, so then we had to send them off to read all these CDMA things. Yeah, yeah. So he gave him Sergio's book and said, go, <laughs> go learn what's in there. Like, yeah, he was like, CDMA, what is that? He had that? never heard of it. You know, but, he but see the codes and all that. Huh? Yeah, that's what I was looking for. It does oh. depend on it. Does depend on it. Oh, through the data. Oh, oh. All these discussions, you know, yeah, you yeah. really have it. Oh, okay, so it does. Your intuition was right. Well, I'm sorry. So maybe yeah, we suppose. So. Yeah. So you said yeah, you would yeah. have an explanation of this in later slides. What were you going to say? Perhaps you could say that. Uh, so uh, that is for what Wahid uh, uh, Oh, that is a Wahid question. Sorry. Okay, so I guess that, that goes out the window. Well, it depends on what that effect really is. And maybe, yeah. you know, maybe it's. Probably Actually, that's uh, right before me. Okay, so let's, let's... Okay, good okay. So, I, I, I but this discussion, uh, can you go back to the previous slide? So I guess to uh, M is the number of users, right? Yes. Uh, so M is the number of tennis. M is the number of tennis. I'm sorry, you missed the number of tennis. Uh, so, like if I, if I scale K, much faster so that K over M goes to zero. In, in that case, just in the general case, do we know that MMSC and match filtering have the same performance? Yeah, yeah, I see okay. that, that's coming in the next slides. Okay. I do have that particular fact in the next slides. Okay. So, so then it is your, Roy, then your, your point is just some rearrangement of terms that sort of made it look like that. Maybe. I, I, that's you know, sort of what you said. But that's kind of a, a non-constructive statement to say, oh, yeah. I couldn't figure out anything. Better. But it has a nice intuitive look when you put it like that. It says, here is an additional suppression you get because yeah. of doing an MMSC as opposed to the match filter. And then it collapses back to the other one. Okay, you can go on. Okay, so this is the case when I, uh, so this is the case when I do a MMSC filtering with a perfect estimate. Uh, with a multi, in a multi cell multi, multi cell multi user setup, so we see that uh, as uh, uh, M and K go to, go to infinity at a fixed ratio, the sign R converts in probability to this particular expression, where uh, this is again the the interference suppression that I achieve uh, with an MMSC filter with a perfect estimate. This filter is basically trying to suppress the interference only from its own users. And uh, here again, I can uh, calculate eta one as a solution to this uh, particular fixed point equation. To, uh, to answer uh, Professor Wahid's question, if alpha again goes to zero, we'll get back just the SNR uh, in this particular case. So is that a, does that answer your question? Sort of. I, 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 well, let's keep going and we'll, we'll come back. Okay. So maybe as I as Roy was saying there perhaps there is no good explanation other than well it's just some mathematics which which may take us a while to wrap our head around. Okay. So I assume uh, I use this result as a benchmark for the performance of the system with the pilot contaminated estimate. We again uh, do a similar uh, simulation with an ideal setup. We consider a seven-cell model, 
uh, with uh, six inter cells interfering with central cell. Uh, we consider three different scenarios where the other cell receive powers at uh, 10 dB, 20 dB, and 30 dB lower as compared to the in cell receive powers. Uh, so, the first case is when uh, there is a strong interference from other cells, uh, which means that the other cell receive powers are just 10 dB below the uh, in cell receive powers. Uh, and in this case, I plot again the alpha in the x axis and the, SI, the SINR in the uh, y axis. And the blue curve corresponds to the uh, perfect estimate MMRC filter. The black corresponds to the pilot contaminated uh, estimate MMRC filter. And the red corresponds to the pilot contaminated estimate match filter. So as you can see, when there is a strong interference from other cells, uh, the, the pilot contamination performs more close, is, the performance is more closer to the, uh, as that of a match filter with a pilot contaminated estimate. Uh, this is because the MMRC filter is not actually designed to suppress the other cell interference. It is only designed to suppress the in-cell interference. Uh, so, we, so we suggest it would be a better idea to use just the match filter uh, in such a scenario. But, uh, Why? I'll go back to that statement. The match filter is designed only for in-cell interference, not other cell interference. Can you amplify on that, please? Yes. Uh, so. So in this, uh, in, uh, in achieving this uh, expression for the SINR, uh, I consider that uh, the uh, the I consider in, sorry in deriving this expression for the filter, I consider that uh, I'm I know the I know the channel estimates are valid only for the users in that particular cell in that in that in the first cell. Okay. So I average out the interference from. Uh, the, all the users in the other cell, which is captured in this uh, uh, in this theta one, uh, so you can already see that the uh, the averaging out reflects as as k goes to infinity, the expect, uh, reflects an expectation of beta j. Yeah, what I'm missing is, I mean, the match filter. Uh, suppose you're uh, trying to decode the signal for user one, so you just correlate this receive data bearing signal across your array with the estimate to, uh, to terminal number one. And in doing so, because of the partial orthogonality of that channel with the channels to the other terminals of the cell, you're suppressing the interference from the transmissions from the other terminals. But aren't you also suppressing the interference from the uplink signal <coughs> to the terminals in the other cells in the same way? I see in no wise that it's different. Uh, yes, it is. Um, that is uh, so. That is uh, that is captured in the alpha. I mean, like that's that's the uh, that's the whole point of uh, that's the point of trying to make in the, in the case of the match filter. Uh, in, in the sense. Uh, uh, so uh, we can uh, suppress the uh, the other cell. Uh, so if, if you assume a large number of address, any two users have orthogonal uh, end up having orthogonal channels using a lot of large numbers. However, uh, if, you, if you sum up the interference uh, interference powers contributed by each of the users, uh, it actually ends up being some some value. Actually, some uh, it doesn't go to doesn't exactly go to zero, but it it is dependent on the ratio of uh, the k by m. Uh, so does that uh, give a? Maybe it's just a semantic issue. So uh, here we are. Uh, just explain that we get some uh, different subscriptions to the MMC and how we calculate the uh, C. And here I <coughs> just uh, uh, find the results for SINR with a with a uh, with a uh, with a like perfect channel estimate and MMC filter. And and yeah. So I was, I was explaining this uh, simulation uh, simulation results. So we we here see that uh, uh, 
so this again comes back to I think uh, Dr. Marzita's question as as to why. Uh, So I think what I'm trying to say here is that if the other cell interference powers are strong, then this particular filter that I designed uh, considered only the channel estimate for users within that first cell. Uh, so, so all the other users on the other cells, the inter their interference is kind of this, their interference won't be suppressed. Their interference won't be averaged out. But you're not doing anything with a matched filter that's particular to the other terminals in your home cell. You're not doing anything differently for them than you're doing for the bandits in the other cell. I understand what he's talking about. Okay. Apparently. So, so in the cell of interest, right, you form channel estimates of the, the the antenna responses or the signatures of the users in that cell. And the MMSE filter. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, is, MMSE, is okay. Based on, right, on, right. On okay. knowing, is you, you assume, you know, if I think with the right. CDMA setting, you know the signatures of people right. in yourself, and you just live okay. with the interference from people in the other. Got it. So that's, that's, right. that's right. the difference. You know, when you, I yeah. heard him say this thing earlier, and I thought, well, what does he mean? And then you asked the question that I was going to ask. But it's this question of, he never tries to estimate the channels of people in the other. Exactly. So, uh, so that's where your MMSC is helping. Yeah. It's with your own companions yeah. in your own home cell. And yeah. Yes, right. we now understand. Right, got it. Sorry. Yes. No, I maybe, 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 I'm, maybe I'm not here. No, you no, were no, fine. I understand. There was some, maybe a sentence about the fact that you aren't trying to estimate these other these other signatures. Oh, okay. Uh, of yep. the other slate. So the only way I can explain is by using CDMA <laughs> You don't know the other signatures. Okay. Yeah, okay, so, so so let's go to the other the other, you haven't talked about the picture on the right or yeah. the bottom. So this this corresponds to the fact that the other cell receive powers are thirty dB lower than the in cell receive powers. Uh, uh, so in this in this particular scenario we already see that the pilot contamination is not a big effect because already there's no the other cell receive powers are pretty pretty low. So uh, so the, the so the pilot match MMC filter with the pilot contaminant estimate actually performs close to that of a uh, close to that of an MMC with a perfect estimate, and these points again corresponds to the uh, simulation results with uh, different realizations of the Rayleigh fading channels, and we see that it is again clustered around the asymptotic limit. So uh, the actual uh, so up there, the bulk, the channel estimation of the in-cell users is really good because the other cell interference is weak. Yes, sir. and uh, and the filter is suppressing all the in-cell. All, all the in-cell. It's all kind of like a almost like a single yes, single cell single MSE cell. filter system with, with known known uh, signatures. Yes, exactly. Yes. So uh, just provide these extreme uh, scenarios one and. And this, is, this is probably a scenario where the uh, where the MMC filter with the pilot contaminant estimate should be more useful. In the sense in the when the interference is not uh, in kind of in the mid range with minus 20 dB uh, less than the uh, in cell received powers. Uh, in this case, we can see that uh, of up to seven to eight dB can be gained with an alpha equal to around point, uh, point two five to point five region from that of a pilot contaminant estimate. But from that a match filter with a pilot contaminant estimate. Uh, and we see that it's kind of just away around four to five dB from that of a perfect estimate. Uh, is it the same that when you plot on the x axis alpha is really you're varying one factor and not the other? Uh, alpha is? Uh, so you have x axis alpha factor, right? Yes. Is that obtained using varying both K and M or just one? No, uh, I assume I in this for this particular simulation I make M constant and vary K. So is it really a, a, a the x axis is really a function of K only? Yes, x axis is really a function of K only. But I would think that this would be valid for any uh, M and K, even if we vary. Right, that's what I was going to ask. Have you have like the same trends hold if you were to really change both the number then have just alpha. I think it, the SNR would be the same as long as alpha is the same. It really doesn't depend on probably. So in this case, I assume M of 50 users. So and 
and say 0.5 corresponds to the point in that the 25, sorry, 25 users and 50 antennas. That corresponds to alpha equal to 0.5. Probably if I use 50 antennas and 100, 50 users and 100 antennas, I would, I would be getting the same as saying that. Like the gaps and everything will still remain the same. Yes, it would, it would remain the same. Do you think the, um, the, the, the snapshots would be different? No, no. You know, for when you actually create the users, the, the ex kind of the, I call it the experimental data almost, not exactly that. You think those would be kind of scattered with the same variance? Yes, it, uh, oh, the, the variance actually I'm... Um, you know, the, the randomness of how spread those snapshot results are around this asymptotic result. That that could be different, actually. That could, might be different. That could be different, For yes. bigger M or smaller. Yes, I think for bigger M it would be maybe... But from the expressions, there, there's nothing... No, the, the analysis is the same. Right. He's asking about the simulation. Right. So the solid curves aren't going to change. Yeah. Yeah, 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 but maybe the simulations would change. But when it comes to rates, everything average out and collapses to the... Yeah, well, that's, yeah that's analytical, right? That's possible to change. Yeah, my point is for the simulations, even for the simulations, if we take the rates, it all, it all collapses to the, to the point. I'll probably, I think I'll... Uh, I think we're heading back towards Tom's first question. Oh, yeah. About, about what are we averaging over if we actually had to, to do coding here. Well, let's... let's okay. Going <laughs> okay. for alpha I zero here, the right. top left curve seems to be doing a different thing. I mean, it, the, the top right and the bottom curve seem to be doing something intuitively correct, which is the match for the analysis on top of each other. But the one on the left, shows like a 10 dB difference and the only thing different between these plots is the extent of other cell difference. Yes. So, so the so the reason is like when you have other cell difference, uh, uh, so uh, so this is the case of perfect MMC. Uh, when you have other cell interference, this kind of captures the, this kind of term dominates actually. But alpha zero. Oh, okay. Alpha equals zero. No, in, in in both cases. Oh, yeah. So you you uh, you're talking about this black curve. I'm talking the difference between the matched filter and the MSC is like a 10 dB gap or 8 dB gap. These two seem to be doing the right thing. Anyway, no, this is not a this is a match filter with a pilot contaminated estimate. This is not a match filter with a perfect estimate. So somehow it's more uh, sensitive. Uh, so this is the, the gap caused by pilot contamination. As this gap is caused due to pilot contamination. These two curves both undergo pilot contamination, and that's why it is uh, that's yeah, that's why this gap always occurs. Mm -hmm. So this particular gap is contributed by just by pilot contamination. Okay. Uh, can I move? Okay. So. Uh, so I, I, in, this, in this plot, I, I, I have a varying alpha. Again, I fix the number of antennas and, and uh, increase k. And I plot the sum rate of the system, which is calculated with this particular uh, expression, uh, where if you have, uh, I can, yeah, the rate is calculated as this particular expression. And, uh, and I plot the results for uh, uh, three ideal cases, where the other cell interference power is minus 10 dB, minus 20 dB and minus 30 dB, uh, it's like decreasing interference. So why is blue curve peaking up and then following all? Yeah, so uh, I think, uh, so the, the, the answer to that is, if in the initial cases, alpha is like, uh, number of users is very small. So basically I'm just uh, not summing up or maybe I'll, I'll be summing on two, three users. Uh, on the other extreme, I, I, I might end up having a, uh, because alpha is uh, uh, alpha is a pretty significant number, uh, I might have the log, the term inside the log, uh, quite small, even though I have a large k here. But wouldn't the linear term outside always beat the logarithmic term inside? Uh, I, I would uh, think that if log, it's. I'm actually not. Uh, so alpha n is k, right? Yeah. Uh, right. So. Yeah, yeah, k. 
I mean, if I had just, if I just considered a simple, the, just the simplest uh, IID noise channel with multiple users all transmitting at once uh, with the same SNRs to, to, to a receiver. So every time I double the number of users, my SNR, SINR goes down by 3 dB, but I have twice as many users, so I have a, a two outside the logarithm and a one half inside the logarithm, and the two outside is always going to beat that one half in. It should saturate, but it should never decrease. That would, that's sort of what I'm getting at here. But you're decreasing, and so there's something at work here making the thing decrease, I think. So, so you're happy with the first part of the curve where you have a lot right. of space. Right. You're, you're basically getting a linear increase yeah, in some rate with, because the logarithm. The pretty empty. Well, the SINR is so low that, uh, or the SI, I'm uh, sorry, the SINR is big and, yeah, that's right. But I don't see why the thing is decreasing. So, so the red curve kind of has the flavor of what yeah. you expect. But the black even is decreasing a bit. That's peaked out. Uh, so uh, minus 30 dB has the same significance as before. Is that yes, uh, yes, it is the same as having a, just an, uh, a single cell anomaly mm -hmm. uh, filter. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't have an actual answer at the top of my head, but I would think that this it has to do with something uh, related to the way uh, the anomaly behaves in a single cell scenario. I, I would think so. I think it wouldn't it have. Oh, well, so does that have perfect. to do with the pilot contamination and the fact that you, you know, the what you describe is correct when you have perfect, perfect. knowledge of the the, the signature, mm. right? But he doesn't as he loads up K and, and mm. wait, but as you load up K, you don't actually you don't degrade the quality of your channel estimate because the in cell. So you're saying that the pilot contamination, even though it's way down, is catching up with you there. No, but uh, the, I'm not sure I, will, I was going to suggest that, but I think it's wrong. But yeah, to be frank, the blue curve plots, plots the case when uh, there's uh, very less interference from other cells. So, so, so in the blue curve, is the 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 channel estimation always good for all alpha? Yes, yes. It's always fine because yes. the contamination from the other cells and the, this interference there is really weak. Yes. Right. Yes. So what is bad all the way? So what is getting bad? That yeah, as alpha gets large. I won't put in the five. blue curve. And uh, even I'll someone in the black. The curve. only thing I can think of is maybe S A N R. S A N R gets bad. So why is it getting bad? Because as you as you increase alpha. Uh, so because as you increase alpha, you you will get more interf the effect of interference is more pronounced. But you know, normally, so Tom was saying, you, you do that kind of a, a thing, and you know, it usually you get to some limit, right? You this factor is increasing. Yes. Uh, Area, I, I, you know, get rid of like sigma, and then you get the alpha, then then you know, <laughs> talk to Tom or anybody, you know, that log is. Now that could be sort of a squaring effect because remember, on the uplink, you're doing two things here: you're ch estimating the channel from the pilots, and then you're trying to send data. And so, I remember I did a paper with her, the Swede, their Larsh and company. We were looking at uh, radiated energy efficiency on the uplink as you increase numbers of antennas. And for a while, every time you double the number of antennas, you can cut back the radiated power of the terminals by 3 dB and do just as well as before. Yeah. But because you're using this uplink signal both for the pilots and for the data, you get a squaring effect. And eventually, you double the number of antennas, and you can only cut back on the radiated power by square root of 2. We've so, been working on that. Like so I'm wondering if you're having a similar effect here. So as you increase the number of ah, I remember you were you were you were cutting. What is your total pilot power as a function of k? Is it constant or is it or is, does it increase linearly with k? Uh, I think it increases linearly with k. So the power pilot power per terminal is constant as k increases. Yes, yes. And so in this case, I it's a typical. In the setup, I assume that uh, the uh, there's a fixed energy per current time, and locating the 
the data the data transmission power actually scales with the number of antennas, but uh, I don't scale the file transmission by by the number of antennas. Hmm. I think um, uh, you know I don't want to push things, but I think actually I, you you will just give you the task of reporting back yeah. to us why this is happening. Yes, I think you'll go over an hour. You'll figure out exactly what the reason is. Yeah, maybe it's some power normalization. As you it out. could be the power normalization, yeah. so, but exactly. I think <coughs> this is exactly the kind of thing that I I rely on you to. Yeah, I'll do this. Uh, going uh, going forward, uh, I'll so I'm con uh, going forward. So far, we consider an ideal scenario. So, uh, so in this case, I'm uh, considering the same cell cell model, uh, but instead of uh, uh, instead of an ideal scenario, I consider some standard path loss uh, fading models. In this particular case, I I consider a cost to the to the given model, and uh, and try to. Explain the implications of uh, using a pilot current to estimate filtering. So, uh, so one of the first things that we can think is of a like a, a favorable scenario where during the channel estimation process, the the interference contributing to the pilot contamination is actually far from that of the uh, user estimating the channel. Uh, in that case, we can see that their receipt powers are very much some of the receipt powers are less as compared to that of the. Uh, uh, in cell user, and as a result, uh, the SNR performance performs as good as the uh, as a match filter, uh, not as not as a match filter, as a as a filter with the perfect estimate, where I really don't have the uh, the the pilot power cost. I'm not impaired by the pilot contamination in this particular case. Uh, I can also think of a, uh, another extreme scenario uh, where if all the users doing the channel estimation is actually uh, very near to that of the in-cell users. So for, uh, for this particular case, just assume that we just have distance weight path loss. So in order to explain this particular case, although it is true even otherwise. So when uh, all these are closer, we can see that the sum of the boys contributed by the uh, pilot uh, simultaneous transmission of pilots is uh, almost equal to B minus 1. And, and in this case, the performance uh, is uh, the uh, shifts away from the uh, ideal uh, shift away, shifts, shifts away from the ideal scenario. The point of these slides is uh, pilot contamination affects uh, the it makes the worst case scenarios even worse. It may not affect the perfect uh, scenarios as much, but it makes the worst case scenarios worse. Uh, <coughs> the uh, so I in this in this in this the next slide I'm trying to plot the 80 percent range of SNRs. That is the uh, I find out the 10 percentile SIR, SINR as well as a 90 percentile SINR, and I say that the SINR due to uh, using a pilot contaminant uh, fil SINR filter using a pilot contaminant contaminant estimate is in this particular range. So that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, so we have an expression for the for the SINR, which is dependent only on the betas, and it doesn't depend on the small scale fading. So, uh, so I, I I generate the expression of interference suppression. Uh, uh, this expectation of beta minus this co uh, constant, as well as that for a perfect uh, estimate, and the infer interference suppression uh, or the interference term actually. This is the interference term. I'm sorry. The, I calculate the interference term. For the pilot-based MMC as well as the perfect MMC, and uh, uh, I plot the CDF of the asymptotic expression. The CDF is actually uh, it's a CDF because of varying receipt powers, random receipt powers, and it doesn't it does not involve small scale fading. Uh, I plot the CDF and found the 10 percent, find the 10 percentile as well as the 90 percentile SINR. Uh, I hope I'm clear on that, and. For the simulation, I capture the effects of the small scale fading, uh, in addition to the randomness due to receive powers. And during the simulation, I also assume that uh, the training sequences are actually uh, independent in, in, in different in different cells, as opposed to the fact that I repeat the same in cell orthogonal train sequences across the cells. Uh, so I consider both two scenarios, and I think I am trying to answer the question that. Uh, Professor Rohit Bajwa asked whether uh, is pilot contamination is a 
is considering a uh, repeat, uh, repeated sequences across cell a pessimistic view or not. So uh, using that, uh, I plot the uh, uh, the the SIRs for the for varying alpha for 50 antenna base stations. This black curve corresponds to the case of a 10 percent LSIR, and this uh, with a pilot pilot based anomaly. And this corresponds to a 90 percent LSIR with a uh, pilot based anomaly. And this corresponds to 10 percent SIR of a perfect anomaly, and this corresponds to 90 percent SIR of a SINR of a perfect anomaly. Uh, you can see that uh, looking at the 10 percent LSIR, you can see that there is a 5 dB. Uh, okay, just one more thing. And, uh, and 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 these points corresponds to simulation results incorporating the small scale fading. And uh, uh, in this plot, there are actually two points here: one black as well as dead, red. The black corresponds to the case when I repeat the same sequences uh, in ortho training sequences across the, in all the cells, and the red corresponds to the case when I assume uh, that each cell generates its own independent orthogonal training sequences for its own users. So we see that actual, we see that the performance uh, of the uh, independently generated training sequences is no better than that of uh, sequences which are repeated across the cells. And uh, uh, in this plot, which uh, which says a 10 percent LSIR, we say uh, we can find that in, in most of the cases the uh, the worsening in terms of the SIR is like this 5 dB. The sense pilot, and this shift is purely due to pilot contamination. And uh, while in the case of 90 percent LSIR, uh, we don't see, we probably see around 2, three, two to 3, d, two, uh, three dB version. And uh, we can say that for an operating an alpha of 0.2, that 0.2, the range of SIRs is that we are ex we can expect to get is between uh, 0 to 25 dB. Actually, my question was not that you just generate okay. independently differently because yes. if you do that, right, you you are still not going to maintain the orthogonality or, or, or like have worse correlation. Like if you try to do that, you have to be more careful uh, so that you exclude very correlated signatures. Uh, okay. But, okay. but my question was more like if you really throw down the users and if the, if the time delays are sort of uh, not really comparable to each other, then the sequence that you receive because of their autocorrelation property. If you again, it has to depend upon how, what kind of sequence you use for your pilot. If, oh. if, if you, uh, you know, so if you just do this kind of thing, I, I suspect that you would get what you are getting because you may still generate very poor data. So this is more into trying to find the sequences, trying to design the sequences. Right. So, so I guess the question I will ask is. Again, in these simulations, did you really, like, you are still assuming synchronous reception and everything is synchronized? Yes, I, I do assume that everything is synchronous. So then I would expect the same. Okay. Okay. I mean, the insidious thing about pilot contamination is, I mean, if you have completely asynchronous operation from cell to cell, then uh, just uplink data transmission in other cells while the home cell is doing training will still cause pilot contamination because these uplink data sequences are all going to be correlated with pilot sequences. Sure, and, sure. Uh, it's, uh, as I say, a very insidious thing. Okay. Okay. Uh, in this, uh, in this, so in this plot, uh, we, I plot the achievable rate versus varying alpha. Again, it's a 50 antenna base station, and uh, I vary uh, I vary the number of users, uh, and the blue curve corresponds to the perfect MMC, and the red corresponds to the uh, pilot based MMC, and uh, and we can see that for most values of alpha, which are uh, pretty large, like uh, 0.1 to 1.5, we get uh, the 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 rate that we achieve in a pilot based MMC is like is like within one bit of that of a perfect MMC. So typically at alpha equal to 0.4, we get three bits per second, uh, bits per symbol. And while at uh, uh, with the perfect MMC, we'll get around 3.8 uh, bits per symbol. 
and this decreases because as alpha increases, the interference increases. And in, in summary, we considered uh, so that's the my research. And in summary, we considered linear filters for multi-cell, multi-NS system, uh, and we dis we quantified the performance using a uh, pilot interference-based channel estimate. Uh, we found the expression for the asymptotic SINR, and using that expression, expression, uh, we we presented some results based on that. And we also quantified the achievable rate. And in fact, I also checked with the case of a very low number of antennas, like 10 antennas and three users. In fact, even for a system with 10 antennas and three users, uh, the the asymptotic expression is still valid. And, and future work, uh, there are many possible f future directions that we can take. One one of the things is like uh, the channels need not be actually uh, completely independent IAD, IAD across the antennas. It can be correlated. So correlated channel model is a uh, thing that we can think of. Uh, another thing is like distributed antennas. These these need not be co-located antennas. These can be distributed in space. So in that case, the difference is that uh, for each associated, associated with each antenna, we have a different received power. We can take into account and do a similar analysis. Uh, we can also uh, think of a uh, low power regime in the sense, if we think of a downlink, we are actually, uh, if we have a large number of antennas, we, we are actually dividing the power by M for each of the antennas. So typically, if we have a large number of antennas, this, this ends up being in a low power regime. So I think there is uh, a lot of research that we can do in, a, uh, in terms of the low, low power regimes. Uh, another thing that I was thinking is we, we, we have these adaptive filters in CDMA systems which, uh, which, which does not rely on, the, uh, rely on the exact channel estimation. Instead, they use the uh, estimate the covariance and, uh, and use the covariance to uh, and basically use that covariance. So uh, I, was, I was thinking if that could avoid the pilot contamination altogether. Uh, but the challenge here is that, again, we don't have time for the estimation as the coherence time is uh, pretty short. If we had sufficient coherence time, then it's possible, we know. But if we don't have it, then we may have interesting problems to design in, in, in using adaptive filters. Uh, 